Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 10 for advanced linear algebra. Today we're going to be learning about something called the standard matrix of a linear transformation. And the idea here is to do something for linear transformations that's very similar to what we did for vectors from vector spaces back a couple lectures ago. Remember we talked about how you could construct the coordinate vector of a vector, right? And the idea there was a coordinate vector, it was just a list of how far that vector is pointing in each of the different directions specified by a basis. Okay, well, for the standard matrix of a linear transformation, it's the same idea, it's just you have to be a little bit more careful because now you sort of have input and output directions, right? Because it's a function. Okay, so this time we're going to have a basis of the input space and a basis of the output space, and we're going to have coordinates corresponding to each of them. So the details are a little bit messier, but the idea is the same. It's just you're going to construct a matrix now out of a linear transformation, and the entries in that matrix sort of specify, in a sense, how far that linear transformation is pointing in, you know, that input direction and the output direction. All right, so here's, here's how it works. Okay, so this is sort of a theorem and definition rolled into one. It tells us what the standard matrix is, and also the theorem part of it is what it does. Okay, so our setup is you've got two vector spaces, and we're going to have a linear transformation between them. So vector spaces V and W, and we've got a linear transformation T going from V to W. Okay, and we're going to need bases on these vector spaces for this all to work as well, for us to be able to talk about coordinates. So you got bases B and D of those vector spaces V and W. So B is a basis of V, D is a basis of W. Okay, and we're gonna need to give names to the vectors from B. So that's why we write there. B consists of the vectors V1 up to Vn. Vn. Okay, and W is just any old M-dimensional uh, vector space. Okay, then what we do is we define a matrix in this way down here, okay? So I'm jumping around in this theorem and definition a little bit, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to define the standard matrix of T with respect to these bases in this way, okay? And so we use this notation here, which is very similar to the not notation that we used for change of basis matrices. Sort of what this is saying is it's the matrix corresponding to T that converts the basis B into the basis D, okay? So it's like change of basis matrices, um, just because, I mean, T here, it's, it's sending V into W, so, you know, it sort of has to send the basis B of V into the basis D of W. And the way that's constructed actually is very similar to change of basis matrices as well, okay? So here's the ugly formula, but what it is, is you, you apply the matrix, or sorry, you apply the linear transformation T to each of the basis vectors from the old basis B, from the, base, uh, the basis of the input space, right? Okay, so T gets applied to V1, and then you represent that in the new basis, in the output basis D. Okay, and then that's your first column of your matrix. And then the, the second column of, of the matrix is just gonna be, you do the exact same thing, except V2 is your input now, okay? And you apply T to it, and you represent it in the output basis. And so on down the line, you get one column from each of these input basis vectors. So at the end of the day, you end up with a matrix that has M rows and N columns, okay? So the, the dimensions of these vector spaces determine how many rows and columns your matrix has. Okay, so when you construct this matrix, well, what's the point? What's it do? Okay, and that's what this equation up here tells us, okay? What that matrix does is it has the really nice property that if you take any coordinate vector with respect to the input basis and you multiply by this matrix, then you get a coordinate vector with respect to the output basis after the linear transformation has been applied to it. So again, this is very reminiscent of change of basis matrices, except this one, these matrices, these standard matrices, they have the added effect of applying a linear transformation in between. All right, so this is sort of saying that, hey, if, if you want to apply a linear transformation to a vector and then represent it in some basis of the output space, you have two ways that you could do that. Okay, you could do it by definition. You could apply the linear transformation and then compute the coordinate vector of the thing. Or you could do it another way now. You could compute the coordinate vector of the input vector and then multiply by some matrix. Multiply by the standard matrix. It's the one that does the job. And either way, you'll get the same answer. All right, so there are just a couple of notes that I wanna make before we go through some actual concrete examples here. Um, so yeah, I've already talked about this one. The, the point of the standard matrix is it converts coordinate vectors in the input space to coordinate vectors of T of V 
in the output space, okay? So it lets you turn the linear transformation into a matrix, basically. It lets you apply linear transformations by multiplying by a matrix, okay? And so, yeah, in a sense, you can think of every linear transformation now as a matrix, all right? And um, it's, it's also good to keep in mind that, I mean, this construction of a standard matrix, it depends on what bases B and D you, you're using, okay? If you change B, so you're changing this input basis, so you're changing all of these Bs, well, the matrix that you get at the end of the day is going to look very different. Similarly, if you change D, the matrix that you construct is going to look very different, okay? So it depends on the bases you're using, just like coordinate vectors depended on the bases that, that we were using, right? There was only one basis back then. But still, a coordinate vector V with respect to B it depended on which basis B you were using. All right, so, so let's prove this theorem, see where, it's, where it comes from, okay? So the thing that we have to prove is this middle equality here. The rest of it's basically definition, right? This equation down here is definition. We have to prove this equality here. We have to prove that this matrix down here does this thing up here that we say it does. All right, so how do we do that? Well, let's just compute it, okay? And we're going to compute it using block matrix multiplication. This is actually very similar to a proof that we saw earlier, okay? So what we're going to do is let's compute this product, okay? Let's compute the standard matrix times V with respect to B, and let's hope that we get T of V with respect to D. That's what we want, all right? So the way that we do that is, well, plug in the definition of this thing, and that's exactly this matrix, which is, again, just sort of defined column-wise, all right, so I just copy and paste it in the definition of the standard matrix over here. And then V with respect to B, well, the way that I figure out what that is, is I write V as a linear combination of the members of B. And then that coordinate vector is just the list of the coefficients in that linear combination. Okay, so V with respect to B, it's C1 up C, C1, C2 up to Cn, where those Cs are the coefficients in that linear combination. Okay, so now I've got this funky matrix product here, and fortunately I can just do block matrix multiplication because of the way this is partitioned, right? So it's just first column times C1 plus second column times C2 and so on, and I get this linear combination down here. Okay, and then the next step, I've used this trick a couple of times now, you can pull scalar multiplication inside of coordinate vectors and you can pull vector addition inside of coordinate vectors. So this linear combination is exactly the same as this coordinate vector of a linear combination. I've just pulled the coordinate vector with respect to D outside of everything, okay? And then this here, I can simplify this piece that's on the inside of the coordinate vector here by using the fact that T is a linear transformation, okay? So I can also pull linear combinations inside of T. I can pull scalar multiplication inside of T, and I can pull these vector sums inside of T. So I end up getting T of linear combination and then coordinate vector on the outside of that. And the reason that this is nice is now this linear combination that I've got on the inside of T is exactly V up here. This is the same linear combination, right? All right, so this is actually T of V. And again, still with respect to D is still on the outside there. That didn't do anything with that. All right, so that's it. Okay, so that's the proof of the theorem. That's where it comes from. So it uses all the same ideas that we've used in these sorts of proofs a couple of times so far in this course. All right. And so let's think again, just at sort of a high level, a little bit more about this theorem before we start, you know, doing actual computations. The idea of this theorem is we've got all sorts of different vector spaces floating around now. We've, we've seen how, okay, if we start off with some vector space V here, I'm going to start at this top right corner in this diagram. If I start off with some vector space V and I've got a, a vector little v in it, there, there are all sorts of things that I could do to it. I could apply some linear transformation T, which takes it over to some vector space W, right? If I apply some linear transformation T that maps into W, then I get T of V after I do that, okay? Another thing that I could do to V instead is I could compute coordinate vectors in there. So maybe I fix some basis B of V and then I compute coordinate vectors of things in this space and, and I end up with the coordinate vector of V with respect to B and that lives in Rn, right? It's just a list of N numbers. So it lives, lives in Rn, okay? So what that theorem says is that, well, from these two spaces, I can get to sort of a common middle ground in two different ways, right? If I went over to W first by applying the linear transformation, then I could compute coordinate vectors in that space, and that gets me to the coordinate vector of T of V, okay? Or I could start with the coordinate vector over here in Rn that I already computed. I could start with this coordinate vector V with respect to B and then multiply by some matrix, the standard matrix, 
And that'll get me to the exact same spot. That'll get me to T of V with respect to D that way instead. So in a sense, like if you focus on sort of the top half and the bottom half of this diagram separately, it says that you can do things in sort of two equivalent ways. You can start off with a vector and apply a linear transformation to it, and that takes you from the right over to the left. Or you could sort of convert everything into coordinate vectors. I could convert things into V with respect to B and then multiply by a matrix instead, and that also brings me from the right over to the left. Okay, so in a sense, applying a linear transformation is the same as multiplying by a matrix. All right, so let's maybe look at some more concrete examples to get a bit of a better feel for how this works. All right, as our first example, consider the transposition map on M2, the, the map that just, you know, transposes a two by two matrix. Okay, and again, to be able to construct standard matrices, you need a basis. So let's just work with the standard basis of the space M2. So that this basis is gonna be the basis of the input and output spaces. It's gonna be the basis of B, it's gonna be the basis B and the basis D, okay? And in this situation where we have the same basis on the input and output space, I'm gonna abbreviate the notation a little bit. Instead of saying, you know, standard matrix of T with, uh, you know, uh, B into D, I'm just gonna say standard matrix with respect to B, just one subscript down there because they're both the same. All right, and the way that you construct it is, well, just go back to the definition. What you have to do is you plug in the old basis vectors, you know, the basis vectors from the input space into the linear transformation and represent them in the new basis, the output basis, D, okay? And then that's your first column for the first basis vector, second column from the second basis vector, third column from the third basis vector, and so on, fourth column from the fourth basis vector, okay? So we've got to compute each of these four columns. So you, again, just working directly from the definition for all of these. T of E11, well, T is the transpose map. So what you do is you take E11, which is this matrix here, it has a one in the one one entry and zeros everywhere else, and you transpose it. Well, transposing that matrix doesn't do anything. So T of E11 is just E11 again. All right, E12 is a little bit more interesting. E12, that has a one in the first row, second column. Okay, so E12 has a one up here and zeros everywhere else, but then you have to transpose it, right? You're applying T to it. So after you transpose it, it turns into this matrix here, which happens to be TE21, or sorry, it happens to be E21, all right? And so on. If you compute T of E21, well, that's gonna be E12. Transpose it, just sw swaps where the one is in the matrix, and T of E22 is just E22, okay? Next up, now that I know what T of these basis vectors is, next up I have to compute the coordinate vectors of them with respect to D, which is again the same basis. All right, so for T of E11, great, it's this matrix. Now I construct the coordinate vector of it. So I ask how many E11s are there in here? How many E12s are there in there? How many E21s are there in this matrix? And how many E22s are there in this matrix, right? Write this matrix as a linear combination of these basis vectors. And well, I mean, all of these matrices are very, very simple. So fortunately you can just sort of eyeball these coordinate vectors. T of E11, well, it just has one E11 in it and zero of the rest of them, right? So the coordinate vector is just one, zero, zero, zero. For T of E12, well, this time there's no E11s, there's no E12s, there's one E21, and there's zero E22. So we just get a one in the third spot and zeros everywhere else. It turns out when you construct coordinate vectors with respect to the standard basis, you're just reading the matrices row by row. So for the, our first matrix, we get one, zero, zero, zero as our coordinate vector. For the next matrix, we get zero, zero, one, zero as our coordinate vector, and so on. So those are our coordinate vectors. I mean, e, t, you have to do T of E21 and T of E22 as well, but those are similar calculations. And then what you do is you take each of these co four coordinate vectors that we compute, and you plop them in as columns, and that gives you your standard matrix, right? So one, zero, 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 that's our first column. Zero, zero, one, zero, that's our next column. And then if we went on and computed these next two guys, T of E21 and T of E22, we would have gotten this and this as our next columns. Okay, so that gives us the standard matrix of the transpose map with respect to the standard basis. All right. Let's maybe go on to one more example, this time working with polynomials and the derivative transformation that we talked about a little bit earlier. Okay, so this time, suppose that you've got the differentiation map sending degree three polynomials to degree three polynomials, and we're gonna find the standard matrix of that with respect to the standard basis again of that space of polynomials, okay? So we're just gonna call this standard basis B. 
All right. So again, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to apply the linear transformation to the input basis, which uh, right there, and then represent that as coordinate vectors with respect to the output basis. Okay. So first off, apply the linear transformation. D of D of one is well zero, right? You're taking the derivative of one. Well, that's zero. D of x, another the derivative of x. Well, that's one. D of x squared, the derivative of x squared, that's 2x. Derivative of x cubed, that's 3x squared. Okay, great. So that's our first step. Next up, represent these vectors as coordinate vectors with respect to the output space. Okay, here the output space, or sorry, the output basis. Here the input and output bases are the same. So you're just representing these vectors with respect to the same basis. All right, so you're asking how many ones are there? How many x's are there? How many x squareds are there? How many x cubes are there? Here, for d of one, there's zero of all of them. So it's just a zero vector. For d of x, well, that's one. So how many ones are there? Well, there's one of them. How many x's? Zero. How many x squareds? Zero. How many x cubes? Zero. So it's the coordinate vector is one, zero, zero, zero. d of x squared was two x. You're asking how many ones are there? There's none of them, zero. How many x's are there? Well, there's two of them. How many x squareds and x cubes? Zero and zero. And then the last one is very similar. D of x cubed was three x squared. So there's three x squareds and zero ones, x's and x cubes. So you get zero, zero, three, zero as your coordinate vector. All right, and then the last step, after you've got these coordinate vectors, just throw them into a matrix column wise. So zero, 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 that's our first column. One, zero, 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 that's our second column. Zero, two, zero, zero, that's our third column. And zero, zero, three, zero, that's our last column. Okay, and that's the standard matrix of the derivative with respect to the standard basis. Okay, so that's maybe still a little bit abstract. Let's try to pin down exactly what that means. Like, why do we care about this matrix? Okay, and well, we have a theorem that tells us why, why we care, but let's really see that. All right, so the idea here is if I start off with some degree three polynomial, so I can write it as a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed, then... If I want to know the coordinate vector of the derivative, I could go in two different ways. One way that I could compute the coordinate vector of the derivative of this is I could compute the derivative directly, and I would get b plus 2cx plus 3dx squared, and then I would compute the coordinate vector of this guy here. So it's just how many ones are there, how many x's are there, how many x squareds, and how many x cubes. And well, it's just there's b, 2c, 3d, and zero of them respectively. So this is the coordinate vector of the output. If you just do everything by definition, that's how you get that quantity there. But we could go a different way now, okay? If we didn't like applying linear transformations and we instead wanted to do matrix multiplication to get the answer, we could instead do it this way. Start off with your vector, uh, your polynomial in this case, a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed, find its coordinate vector, which is just a, b, c, d, and instead, instead of taking the derivative, you multiply this input coordinate vector by the standard matrix. Okay, so multiply by this matrix, by this as a column vector, so you do this matrix times this as a column vector, and, well, maybe this is an exercise for you to try, but you will see that, yes, you get exactly this, again, as a column vector. So you will get the same answer, as long as you rearrange things so that the matrix multiplication actually makes sense. Okay, so that does it for today's lecture. Uh, next class, we'll go on to other things that you can do with linear transformations, in particular, how you combine linear transformations with each other. So I will see you then.